The long-term follow-up on the Resignate 3 trial, um, which compared abrutinib to ofatumumab, showed that abrutinib is far superior than ofatumumab. Um, patients who were on abrutinib for prolonged periods of time uh, achieved a deep and durable response. However, there are certain, there's a small population of patients who are intolerant to abrutinib and they have to come off due to intolerance. Um, certain, certain toxicities associated with abrutinib include fatigue, diarrhea, headache, um, arthralgias, myalgias, um, hypertension, and atrial fibrillation. Most commonly, these toxicities can occur within the first six to 12 months of initiating therapy with abrutinib. Hypertension is one of the toxicities that has a more accumulative effect that can occur a little later, and it's something that we have to continually monitor for, especially people on, on abrutinib for prolonged periods of time. It's really important to follow the FDA label in, with monitoring patients for toxicities related to abrutinib. Um, there's certain ways you can, we've managed patients uh, with abrutinib toxicity. The first way we've done it is sometimes depending on how severe the toxicity is, we'll hold drug for a small period of time, meaning one to two weeks, and we'll rechallenge the patient. Um, additionally, we can dose reduce um, depending on how severe the toxicities are. 30 to 40% of patients on abrutinib will experience some kind of toxicity. Um, 10 to 15% of those patients will actually have to come off therapy due to these toxicities. Depending on what the, the patient is experiencing, um, if it's manageable or tolerable, we will try symptom support. If it's, if it's severe, we will have a discussion with the attending physician and, um, and determine whether the patient will need to stop drug either um, temporarily or permanently or, um, or, or if it can be managed symptom, symptomatically. Depending on the toxicity the patient is experiencing, if they're having diarrhea, you know, for instance, we can try Imodium, um, increase fluid intake, and, you know, and um, amend the diet to simple bland foods following the BRAT diet. Um, if someone's experiencing hypertension, we can add an antihypertensive agent and involve cardiology. Um, so it depends on the toxicity and how severe it is. I typically educate patients uh, when starting a brutinib to report any new symptoms, whether it be um, you know diarrhea, headaches, uh, any new rashes or bleeding that may, that may occur. In addition, I really stress it's really important to um, report any uh, lightheadedness, chest pain, palpitations, uh, um, just to make sure we're not missing an arrhythmia or um, such as atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Um, uh, it's important also to report any kind of procedures that they may be having, um, surgical procedures especially, because we'll have to hold drug three to seven days before and after the procedure. Um, we also note the importance of uh, medication compliance. It's important to take it correctly um, and uh, around the same time every day. We typically monitor the patient um, starting a brutinib therapy with weekly labs on the during the first month. Um, we look for tumor lysis, um, tumor lysis labs along with a CBC. Um, in addition to that, we'll check in with them occasionally to make sure they're, they're tolerating drug uh, okay and they're being compliant. Um, after that, we'll have a check-in visit, uh, typically one month after starting therapy. Depending on how they're tolerating the medication, um, we'll then decide uh, a follow-up schedule with them. Um, we typically see patients at least every three months um, who, are, who are on therapy with abrutinib. It's really important to follow the FDA label for guidance in managing toxicities with abrutinib. Um, you know, the, the label is extremely helpful with uh, guidance um, with dose reduction and symptom management. Um, not every side effect is attributable to, attributable to abrutinib, meaning, um, you know, patients have other comorbidities and they have to be taken into account as well. Um, also, it's really important to utilize the multidisciplinary team. Um, you know, patients may require cardiology consults, um, infectious disease, dermatology, the, use, the important use of primary care and keeping up with, you know, um, pre preventative screenings. Uh, those are really important. Also, utilizing pharmacy um, for potential drug interactions, um, the, in, in addition to the office practice nurses uh, and advanced practice nurses and or APPs. Um, it's really important to uh, encourage open dialogue with your patients, um, whether it be the patient portal or just contacting the office. They have to be really comfortable with communicating side effects and checking in on how they're feeling. That's really, really important.
Patients diagnosed with CLL have a lot more treatment options than previously. Um, the chemotherapy is no longer the sole therapy that is available to them. Um, these targeted novel agents uh, provide a, a better toxicity profile. They're well tolerated and they're very active against people, especially with high risk uh, disease. Um, there's also a lot of exciting clinical trials right now, uh, you know, going on that will hopefully provide even more treatment options in the future. So. Patients have a lot of treatment options and um, hopefully we'll have better outcomes.